The Siege of Elysium. Author's note, y'all can't even begin to fathom just how much I suffered while doing the Elysium prequests over and over again for every single Grandis class, while also taking notes on the whole thing. I've spent almost two months just on this section alone, and good god, these might have been the longest two months of my life. I'll spare you the misery and the melodrama, but I honestly deserve a goddamn medal for this. <laughs> and maybe a vacation to KMS headquarters so I can give the story team a piece of my mind. Kaiser, Angelic Buster, and Cadena in particular were some of the longest prequests just because of how much extra story there was. At the same time, these quests built upon and expanded their class's story in a much needed way, especially with Cadena, and so I consider those quests to be an integral part of their storylines. I initially tried to weave together all the individual class storylines in the same way as I did with Aron and Evans, as well as with Kaiser and Angelic Busters, but I realized that it was too convoluted, and so I decided to keep them separate. However, Kaiser, Angelic Burster, and Cadena's storylines do fit pretty well together, which you'll see from the dialogue, and it's possible to glean from the dialogues as at which points they intersect. There are three main parts to the Helysium storyline. The battle to push into the city, figuring out how to enter Tyrant's castle, and the final assault on Magnus and the three guardians of Helysium. Kaiser, Angelic Buster, and Cadena have a unique story for the first two parts. The second part, which involves figuring out a way to break into the castle, is also unique to them, as the generic story of all other classes skip it entirely. However, every class has the same storyline for the third part. The generic story for the first part doesn't mesh well with Kaiser, Angelic Buster, and Cadena's stories, and so I'd take it I'd take its canosity with a grain of salt, because it really just exists for other classes to say, I participated. A fair warning before we get into it, while the Helysium storyline is genuinely funny at times, it doesn't shy away from reminding you that the majority of the plot is compromised of fetch quest after fetch quest. As such, you'll notice that the writing in this section is basically, he got the thing, and then he got the other thing, and then he killed some other thing, after which he got one more thing. I've made multiple efforts to try and rewrite this section in order to make it sound less monotonous, but the problem is that this is a fundamental issue of the storyline that no amount of clever writing on my end can fix. Not to mention that it's excruciatingly boring for me to waste hours doing it when I'm already so burnt out from drafting this ridiculously long section. Hopefully, you can understand what I'm saying. You can understand when I say I've done the best that I could. After defeating Hilla's forces in the Dimensional Invasion Crisis, the Helysium Reclamation HQ continued pushing forward towards Tyrant Castle. Generic Story Author's Note This story applies to every class who isn't Kaiser, Angelic Buster, or Cadena. It's a bit strange, because the rest of the Grandest classes are treated as people from Maple World. One member of the Alliance was summoned to Pantheon, where they met Beldar, who told them about the Nova's goal to reclaim Helysium, and explained that the Helysium Reclamation HQ was in danger of being overwhelmed by Magnus's forces. The Alliance member made their way towards the dimensional door to Helysium, where they met a soldier named Tyran, who explained that Spectres had launched an aerial attack on the Helysium Reclamation HQ. He asked them to speak with Adia and Piston at the command barracks, as well as to protect as many soldiers as possible from Spectre attacks. After defeating the Spectre invaders, the Alliance member met with Adia and Piston, who thanked them for saving their base. Piston told the Alliance member that the Spectre Battlehounds had played a major role in the enemy's attack, and asked them to defeat the monsters. After defeating the Spectre Battlehounds, the Alliance member returned to see Adia, who told them that they needed to open up the supply lines and ask them to defeat the Spectre Shield Bearers in the Forest of Choices. Within the for with the Forest of Choices opened up, Adia asked them to check with the Quartermaster, Harpoon, about their supply problem. Outside the tent, the Alliance member met Harpoon, 
who introduced himself and his twin brother, Maroon, as well as their younger sister, Karen. Harpoon explained that he and Maroon had chopped off their horns on different sides in order to help people tell them apart. Author's note, I'm guessing that the Nova don't have nerve endings on their horns, kind of like hair or fingernails for humans, since cutting off her horns was a huge source of trauma for Cadena. Most likely, they just chopped off the superficial parts of their horns while Cadena cut her horns from the roots. Harpoon then asked them to collect Dino Goth's shoulder meat in order to restock their rations. After collecting the meat, they returned back to Harpoon, who thanked them and told them that Adia was looking for them. Adia asked them to go to the lush forest where a wise sage named Urinth lived, and instructed them to get his advice on their next assault strategy. The alliance member abruptly. The alliance member abruptly. Adia. I think it meant asked, if she had ever dated Eurynth, to which Adia snapped at them to leave, shaking her head at the things that the people at the base had said. Author's note, there's literally nothing in the, nothing in the way that Adia was describing Eurynth that insinuated that she ever dated him, unless this is just a bad translation job on GMS's part. At Eurynth's hut, the Alliance member attempted to ask for his help, but he refused to entertain them. However, he told them that he would speak with them if they brought Dinor Sirloin from the Twisted Forest border. After bringing him the meat, Urinth lamented that they were useful, which meant that he couldn't give them a hard time like a certain Nova Guardian. He then asked them what they wanted to know. Author's note, this exchange implies that the generic story takes place after Kaiser meets with Urinth. Like I said before though, I personally don't treat the generic story as canon because everything that we do here is a condensed version of what Kaiser and Angelic Buster and Cadena do in their quests. Which means that everything we're doing here would be redundant and pointless if it had already been done before. The Alliance member told, them, told him that they wanted to know how to infiltrate the enemy lines to which Urinth recommended that they seek out a group called the Grandest Shadow, though he warned that they would demand a fee. Author's note, this might be a translation error, as they're actually supposed to be called the Shadow Dealers. The other explanation is that this is an alternate name of the Shadow Dealers, or perhaps the name of the Helysium branch of the Shadow Dealers specifically. Urinth gave the Alliance member a DO3 transmitter, and told them to go north until they found an empty lot free of monsters in order to use the communicator. Before they left, Urinth's pet Kalong, named Popo, asked them to bring it food, as Urinth didn't feed it. They brought back Dino Ram tenderloins for Popo, who thanked them. They then went deep into the Forbidden Forest and used the communicator. A shadow dealer named Toneru picked up and demanded to know their identity as the transmitter ID belonged to Urinth. After learning that they were an off-worlder helping with the Nova, Tenero arrived and greeted them, and asked for Dinodon sharp fangs in exchange for his information. After bringing him the fee, he gave them an envelope with all of the information that they needed, and told them to bring it to Urinth. Before they could return, however, the DO3 transmitter began to ring. With the when the Alliance member answered it, a shadow dealer named Romero told, him, told them to meet him back at the clearing. There, he told them that he would trade valuable information in exchange for Dinoram claws. After bringing him the claws, Romero whispered several secrets in their ear. As soon as Romero left, the transmitter began to ring, and Tonero once again told them to meet him at the meetup spot. Annoyed that Romero was interfering in their trade, Tomero had decided to steal Romero's next deal and asked them to bring him yellow spior torn fur coats. In exchange, Tonero whispered more secrets in their ear and sent them to Urinth. Back at his hut, Urinth gave them the envelope that Tornero had given him and asked them to bring it to Adia. After looking over the information, Adia told them that they would need to launch their major offensive as soon as possible. In order to prepare, she asked them to collect sparkling specter stones 
from the Spectre miners, who had monopolized the ore from the mountains, cutting off the Nova's supply of ores for their weapons and armor. After returning with the ore, Adia received a sudden mission and told them that it was the right time to strike. She explained that she was planning on using a massive lightning spell to destroy the Spectre armor, army and asked, asked them to defeat the survivors once it had been activated. In a fierce battle in the downtown district of Helysium, the Alliance members struggled with repelling the Spectre army until Adia successfully finished casting her spell, sending a massive lightning storm to decimate the Spectre's army. With Magnus's forces in shambles, the Alliance was able to push forward and established a new base in downtown Helysium. Adia thanked them for their support and explained that HQ had enough supplies to hold their own, though they would need to help assault Tyrant Castle in the future. Kaiser Kaiser was summoned back to Pantheon by Beldar, who told him that the Helysium Reclamation HQ was under attack by Spectres. He asked Kaiser to lead a small support squad in an effort to crush the Spectre forces while they were distracted. At the edge of the Helysium Reclamation HQ, Kaiser met Tyrion, who told him that the Spectres had ambushed them and trapped their forces. Kaiser fought off the Spectre invasion and rescued Piston and Adia. Back at the base, Adia told Kaiser that their supplies were running thin and asked him to speak with Piston about what he could do to help. Piston told him that the Spectre Battlehounds had scouted to find their HQ and asked Kaiser to defeat the Battlehounds, as well as to bring back their horns. After completing his mission, Kaiser returned to Adia, who asked him to eliminate the Spectre shield bearers in the Forest of Choices. During the battle, Kaiser defeated the warrior Spectres, leading the shield bearers, and returned with the Spectre, command Spectre Commander Badge. Adia was impressed by Kaiser's skill as only Spectre Generals carried such badges. At Piston's request, Kaiser allowed him to borrow the emblem to show the troops that they were making good progress. Piston then asked Kaiser to work with Harpoon in order to resupply their rations. Harpoon asked Kaiser to get Dinogoth meat, at f or Dinogoth meat for the camp. After returning, Harpoon told Kaiser that Piston was looking for him. Before that, however... Maroon asked Kaiser to help escort the supply line by defeating the dino rams in the way and recover any lost supplies. After helping Maroon, Kaiser went to see Piston, who told, them, told him that they were in the process of reconstructing an ancient weapon called the Blue Dragon Cannon. He then told Kaiser to meet Carnelian, or Cartalian, in Pantheon in order to discuss the details. In Pantheon, Cartalian told Kaiser that they had been building the Blue Dragon Cannon in secret for several months and stressed the importance of the weapon to Kaiser, telling him that it was the last resort that would be needed. Oh, that would need to be dismantled after they were finished using it, as the weapon was too dangerous to fall into the wrong hands. He told Kaiser to speak with Beldar about how he could help finish construction. Beldar asked Kaiser to collect animal oil as fuel for the weapon, which he collected from Red Spears. With the necessary fuel, Beldar told Kaiser that the Blue Dragon Cannon was ready and asked him to take it from Cartalion and bring it over to Adia. At the Helysium Reclamation HQ, Adia told him that Tyrion and Angelic Buster had found the location of a Spectre supply base and asked him to launch the weapon. Though Kaiser was unsure how to use it, Adia told him that he needed mental clarity in order to allow the spirits of the past Kaisers to help him wield it. Kaiser went to see Tyrion, who told him that Angelic Buster had helped him get the coordinates to their target. After getting the coordinates, Kaiser successfully fired the cannon onto the Spectre's base. He returned to Adia, who congratulated him on his mission, and asked him to see Urinth whose information could help them push forward into the central regions. She also gave him a cookie to give to Urinth as well. Kaiser delivered the cookie to Urinth, who immediately spat it out and told Kaiser that Adia had poisoned it. 
Author's note, you'll get more context about this later, but basically, Adia is unhinged, and she's everything that I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> Though he realized why Adia had sent Kaiser to his hut, you're in the plan to make him pay for having forced him to eat a poisoned cookie. First, he made Kaiser collect firewood from the Red Spear monsters nearby. Next, he had Kaiser collect Dino Ram tenderloins for him. Finally, he made Kaiser use the firewood and meat to cook steak for him, claiming that the former Kaiser was an exceptionally good cook. Just then, his pet Popo told Kaiser that it wouldn't help him that it would help him cook for Urinth in exchange for food and blankets. Kaiser brought back Dino Ram tenderloins and blue spear fur coats for Popo, who gave him a batch of special spices. Kaiser used the spices to cook a steak for Urinth, who was thoroughly impressed by Kaiser's cooking skills. In exchange, he gave Kaiser a DO3 transmitter, which, he'll, which would allow him to contact the Shadow Dealers. He explained that the Shadow Dealers were ruthless and that they would do anything for money, claiming that they had handed the secret of creating vision bombs to the High Flora. Author's note. Vision bombs were briefly mentioned in Cadena's story in a throwaway line about how Mr. Hazard sold vision bomb tech to the High Flora. We're yet to see vision bombs in the actual game, but the fact that they were mentioned in Cadena's storyline, which was released five years after the Halesium prequests, makes me think that it'll pop up in the future grandest stories. Kaiser went to the Shadow Dealer meetup spot and used the transmitter. A shadow dealer named Toneru picked up and demanded to know his identity, as the transmitter's ID belonged to Urinth. After Kaiser introduced himself, Toneru arrived at the meeting spot and asked to trade Dinodon sharp fangs in exchange for information that Kaiser was seeking. After bringing him the fee, Toneru gave him an envelope with all of the information that he had needed and told him to bring it to Urinth. Before he could return, however, the DO3 transmitter began to ring. When Kaiser answered it, a shadow dealer named Romero told him to meet up back at the clearing. There, he told Kaiser that he would trade valuable information in exchange for Dino Ram claws. Once he finished, Kaiser brought the claws to Romero, who gave him another envelope full of information. As soon as Romero left, Tonero returned and told him that he would give a third piece of information in exchange for helping Romero, his brother. After Tornero left, Romero returned and traded his final piece of information, as well as his own D02 transmitter, in exchange for Kaiser's D03 transmitter. Kaiser reluctantly agreed, remembering the promise that he had made to Tornero to help Romero. Kaiser then returned to Urinth with the information, who told him that it would be useful to Adia. However, he was displeased that Kaiser had lost the D03 transmitter. He took the D02 transmitter from Kaiser and offered to ma make him a new D03 transmitter in exchange for blue spear torn fur coats. With the coats, Urinth was able to create a new D03 transmitter for him. Urinth then gave the envelopes, then gave him the envelopes to give to Adia. While he looked over the information, Adia told him that Maroon needed his help. Maroon asked him to bring Dinogoth's shoulder meats and blue spear fur coats. After helping Mar Maroon, Kaiser returned to Adia, who asked him to collect sparkling specter stones from the specter miners. After he returned, Adia told him that she had received an urgent message that the specters had kidnapped Captain Tyran. Kaiser rushed into the battlefield and single-handedly destroyed the Spectre forces in order to rescue Tyran. Adia then told him that they were needed to that they were ready to attack the Spectre army, explaining that he would be the bait that would lure them into the valley, where she would obliterate the Spectres with a lightning spell. Following the plan, they were successfully able to retake downtown Helysium, allowing them to move their base forward. Having taken the city, Adia told Kaiser that their next target was Tyrant's castle, and asked him to speak with Piston and Tyran about the status of the operation. 
Fiston told Kaiser that they didn't have enough forces to directly engage the Spectres in a full-scale war, and recommended that they try to strengthen their forces. Kieran added that there was a large number of Spectres in the city, and suggested that they try to chip away at Magnus's forces with guerrilla tactics. After reporting back to Adia, she asked him to break into the castle while they reinforced the camp, as the guards would never expect a lone soldier. She warned him that two of the three guardians of Helysium, Victor and Triglo, had been unable to be rescued when the capital had been lost, meaning that they were now under Magnus's control. She asked him to get the details for Murinth and gave him another poisoned cookie to bring to him claiming that she would burn Urinth's hut down if he didn't eat it. Author's note, again, an actual icon. At Urinth's hut, Kaiser gave the cookie and relayed what Adia had told him. Urinth expressed how much he regretted teaching her magic, though he agreed to give Kaiser the information that he sought after eating the cookie. He explained that Adia, Victor, and Triglo had once been the three guardians of Helysium. Victor was a renowned painter whose work had a huge influence on the Nova people. He had come from a long line of artists, and his father, who, had, who, was said, who was said to have seen works from other dimensions, had named his son Victor in hopes that the line would continue. However, Victor had eventually fallen in love with a dead woman and had painted his masterpiece in her image. Learning of a magical canvas that could bring art to reality, he had spent his life attempting to find it. Knowing that Victor would easily fail under his inf or easily fall under his influences if he obtained it, Magnus asked Darmor to find the canvas. He then used it in order to bait Victor into becoming his servant. However, Darmor had cursed the canvas so that when Victor painted the woman, it spat out a doll in her form and trapped Victor's soul inside of the painting, leaving his body as a puppet for Magnus, after which Victor was forced to paint minions on the cursed canvas that brought them to life. Urinth then explained that Triglo was a genius scientist who was particularly adept in chemistry. Though he had become a guardian, Triglo had secretly wanted to make an artificial creature, which was a taboo among Nova scientists. Magnus had pretended to be a merchant and had sent a spy to support Triglo's research and build an am amicable relationship with him. Magnus had, had been able to obtain rare materials from other worlds for Triglo, though no one knew how, how Magnus had the ability to travel to other worlds. Author's note, the implication that they were going... Wait, the implication that they were going for was likely that Magnus had been using the interdimensional portal to travel back and forth from Maple World. The problem with this is that the interdimensional portal is one way, meaning that you'd need a second portal in order to get back. This creates a continuity error with, with this line because Magnus was said to have brought materials from Maple World before the fall of Elysium which can't have happened because the interdimensional portal on Maple World only appeared shortly before the Black Mage was sealed, which was many years after the fall of Elysium. Though Triglo had, had been close to finishing the artificial creature, Magnus had sabotaged the, the experiment just before the invasion of Elysium, which, was which had caused a huge explosion and had left Triglo mad with grief. The sabotaged experiment had resulted in Triglo creating twisted creatures, and in his madness he had declared them his greatest success before offering them to Magnus as his army. Finally, Urinth explained that the third guardian, Adia, had a foul temper, though she was perhaps his greatest student. However, he explained that he had expelled her because she had destroyed all of his possessions blown up his houses, and forced him to eat her poison cookies. <laughs> Though she seemed to be cool-headed, Urinth was convinced that she would reveal her true nature one day. Author's note. Honestly, I'm pretty sure that this is a bias account from Urinth. You'll see later in Angelic Buster's section 
But this man is a pedophile and a perv, and I don't even want to imagine the kinds of things that he tried to get Adia to do when she was younger and more impressionable as his student. All the stuff that she did to get back at him was more than justified in my opinion. If anything, we should look up to her as role model. <laughs> Always remember, the next time that someone tries to touch you without consent, poison them and cause extensive property damage on their uninsured home. With that, Kaiser asked him for an envelope with the information that Adia had requested, but Yurith decided to put Kaiser to work because of the cookies that Kaiser had brought from Adia. He then told Kaiser to bring him yellow spear fur coats and dinodon sharp fangs from the forest of coexistence. His pet Popo also asked him to bring dino ram tenderloins, as Yurinth refused to feed it. After Kaiser finished the two tasks, Yurinth wrote a letter for Adia that described the curse that Victor and Tree Glow were under, as well as the powers that they possessed. Kaiser then returned with a letter to Adia, who thanked him. Suddenly, he heard a strange noise and went to investigate the city border. There he encountered Velderoth, leading an army of specters. He immediately transformed into his Kaiser form and confronted Velderoth. Velderoth called Magnus Lord Magnus and told Kaiser that he had sought out Magnus after seeing how easily he had defeated them, adding that unlike Kaiser's unique awakening, Magnus could bestow power to anyone. Kaiser tried to reason with Velderoth, but his old friend refused to listen, instead challenging him to single combat and claiming that he would leave with his specters if Kaiser could best him. After a fierce battle, Velderoth acknowledged Kaiser's strength and retreated, promising that he would soon deliver Kaiser to Magnus. After Velderoth left, Adia told Kaiser that it had been a reckless decision to fight him, as it could have been a trap. Kaiser was disturbed by how arrogant Velderoth had become and wondered what Magnus had done to him. He decided to chase after Velderoth, though Velderoth was able to hide and escape amidst the thousands of specters. Kaiser then returned to Adia, who mused that Velderoth had a weak will, despite being unmatched in battle, in battle skills. She acknowledged Kaiser's distress about his friend becoming a traitor, but told him that he would likely need to fight Velderoth again, as he had become Magnus's third guardian of Elysium. She then explained that according to Urant's information, Magnus had learned the secrets of the Nova Royal family's defenses, and that he was using a similar seal to guard the path to the throne room. She told him that they would likely need a shadow dealer's expertise to undo the seal, and asked him to see Tonero. Tonero told him that Triglo was their first obstacle, and that he needed the Red Spear stocks in order to analyze his creatures. Kaiser brought the materials to Tenero, who told him that he would begin his research immediately. Kaiser then went to see Romero, who proposed another deal with him. He asked Kaiser to bring him Spectre's deadly poison from the Gorilla Spectres. With the poison, Romero created a special reagent that he asked Kaiser to drink. Kaiser instead proposed that he would pay Romero to drink it himself. Romero drank the reagent and immediately began turning purple. He asked Kaiser to bring the specter's deadly poison to Tonero, with which Tonero was able to create an antidote for Romero. Tonero explained that Romero's alchemical knowledge was lacking before noting that the specter's poison was the result of Triglo's chemical knowledge. After giving Romero the antidote, Kaiser went to find Adia who asked him to speak with Fennel about how they could undo the ancient Nova seal on the castle gates. Fennel told Kaiser to speak with Anor and Kailan for the information about the unsealing ritual. Kaiser obtained a harvesting guide from Anor that explained how to extract life energy. Back at the Great Temple, Kailan told Kaiser that the Nova seal ritual used on the castle was based on life energy, meaning that life spark was the core of it all, though he didn't know how to extract it. Kaiser passed on the information to Fennel, who told him that she would investigate. In the meantime, she told him that Beldar needed to see him. Beldar told Kaiser that there were signs that the Spectre's army was planning an aerial attack. 
Kaiser rushed to Piston, who told him that a letter from Velderoth had arrived. Upon reading the letter, Kaiser learned that Velderoth wanted to fight one-on-one -on -one again, and that he had prepared to pull the entire Spectre army if he lost. Though Piston warned him that it was a trap, Kaiser felt responsible for Velderoth's fall and decided to, ex to accept his challenge. Kaiser made his way towards the castle and fought his way through the Spectre army. At the castle entrance, Kaiser wondered where Velderoth was, as only Spectres had greeted him. Fearing that it was a trap, he rushed back to the downtown headquarters, where Adia told him that he had been gone. That while he had been gone, Angelic Buster had learned that the enemy was planning an all-out attack. Angelic Buster had managed to fight off the attackers, but Piston had been wounded, though she assured him that Piston would make a full recovery. Kaiser went to see Piston, who told Kaiser not to blame himself for what had happened. He told Kaiser that he had convinced Angelic Buster to put on a show for them alongside Adia. He asked Kaiser to help convince Adia to participate by getting enough signatures from the army. Kaiser convinced Harpoon, Maroon, and Tyrion to gather support from the soldiers, which left Adia with no choice but to concede. Together with Angelic Buster, they put on a show that proved to be a massive hit with the Alliance. After the show, Adia told Kaiser to see Fennel about getting the information about the unsealing ritual. Fennel told Kaiser that they needed to observe the reactions of the materials and the life energy used on the seal. She gave him her research notes to bring to Adia, who asked him to help Tonero while she looked over it. However, Tonero explained that the Shadow Dealers hadn't received proper compensation for helping the Nova yet and asked him to perform some tasks as payment. First, Kaiser helped the Shadow Dealer named Galero collect Moro Tree Sap from the Full Moon Hill and eliminated Gorilla Spectres. Next, he helped Tonero obtain Spectre Candy from the Gorilla Spectres, which he said which was said to improve the Spectre's concentration and awaken their latent powers. Author's note, I wonder if Ark could benefit from this. Finally, he helped Romero obtain Battlehound Broken Horns and Tamer's Whips in order to surpass Tonero as the top traitor. Intrigued by their relationship, he asked Galero about them. Galero explained that his brothers, Tonero and Romero, had been friends from a young age, though Romero had always been jealous of Tonero's abilities. Kaiser then returned to Romero, who asked him for more battle hounds, broken horns, and tamer whips, as well as specter candy, in order to keep his spot as top trader. After Kaiser finished the task, Galero told him that Romero had accidentally flooded the market, and that Romero would lose his profits. In order to help Romero, Tonero secretly purchased Battle Hound Broken Horns and Tamer Whips in order to increase their value. He then gave Kaiser a gold pouch and asked him to convince Galero to buy Romero's entire stock for a profit. Galero successfully bought the stock and gave Kaiser a cut of the profits. Tonero then told Kaiser to find Spectre's wrenches from Spectre Engineers for the unsealing ritual. After he brought them back, Tonero explained that the wrenches contained a special mineral that could only be found on select regions across Grandis, which the Helysium Reclamation HQ had been stealing from Spectre Engineers in order to mine. As the Shadow Dealers weren't experienced with refining ore, he asked Kaiser to go to Ardent Mill in Maple World and speak with Cole. Kaiser asked Cole if he could extract the materials out of the Spectre wrenches. Cole replied that he could, and told Kaiser that he would send the minerals to Tonero as soon as he could. Kaiser returned to Helysium, where Tonero told him that the shipment had arrived just before Kaiser himself. He then gave Kaiser another assignment from Adia, which was to collect sparkling specter stones, wielding welding goggles, and hard back horns. Kaiser returned with the ingredients, but Tonero told him that a new specter agent had appeared, which was much stronger than the regular ones. He asked Kaiser to eliminate the new power specters and bring back the hardback horns. Kaiser brought them back and explained that the power specter restored to brute force, or resorted to brute force, 
and so they could be eliminated with some strategic skill. De Nero then told him about a report from Tyrion about the Spectres launching a small-scale attack. Kaiser intercepted their forces and successfully drove them back before returning to Adia. She told Kaiser that the enemy forces were at a disadvantage, which was an opportunity for them to route to route the remaining Spectres back. Kaiser was successful in rerouting the Spectres and returned to Adia, who told him that Cartalian had arrived to replace Piston as commander while Piston was injured and recovering. Cartalian asked Kaiser to infiltrate the castle in order to thin out the enemy numbers for the exhausted Nova troops. He gave Kaiser a Spectre disguise made by Urinth and his own D-02 transmitter and sent him to Tyrant's castle. Kaiser successfully infiltrated the castle and contacted Cartalian, who asked him to learn the abilities of the high-ranking specters in the castle. Kaiser learned the battle tactics of the warrior specters and collected specter cubes from the magician specters. Kieran then contacted Kaiser about how to escape, explaining that there was a secret tunnel behind the center golden ornament in the castle's foyer. After escaping, Kaiser met with Cartalian, who told him that Adia had perfected the unsealing ritual, and that it was his responsibility to protect her from specters while she opened the castle's doors. Kaiser successfully defended Adia, who blasted open the castle doors. Kaiser then stormed the castle and fought his way past the guards. Having secured the parameter, Adia told him that their final objective was to secure the rest of the castle. She also told him, that because of his accomplishments, he would be promoted to general, though Kaiser was reluctant about the appointment since he preferred to work on the field. Adia told him that he needed to undergo a trial called the Proof of Greatness and asked him to speak with Cartalian and Piston. For the first trial, Cartalian told him about the wisdom of generals, explaining that they needed to be able to make quick decisions in battle. He then gave Kaiser his second trial and asked him to speak with the townspeople about their troubles in order to understand what it meant to be defenseless. Kaiser helped Tyrion get new magnifying glasses for his code deciphering by lending him money and helping to Romero with the side effects of his poisonous reagent by bringing him Spectre's deadly poisons to mis mix with another antidote. Having passed the second trial, Cartalian gave him the final trial of defeating the warrior and magician specters and bringing back proof of his deeds. Having passed all the trials, Cartalian officially approved Kaiser's promotion to Knight Captain. Author's note, Knight Captain and General are used interchangeably in this storyline. Kaiser then went to see Kadia for her insight, and the two discussed the merits of him fighting on the front lines. Adia told Kaiser that she would speak with Cartalian about supporting him in his role as general so that he could continue on his solo missions. Angelic Buster Angelic Buster learned from Beldar that Kaiser had gone to the Helysium Reclamation HQ, and so she decided to go after him. On the way, she encountered Tyrion, who told her that a Spectre ambush had resulted in many of their troops being killed. Though Kaiser had fought them off, Tyrion explained that there were more specters arriving through the back in order to cut them off. As she fought off the specters, Adia followed her out of concern, but she was impressed by Angelic Buster's power and asked her to meet at the commander's barracks. There, Adia told her that they needed to break the enemy's defensive stronghold and asked her to defeat the specter's battlehounds. Angelic Buster defeated the hounds and brought back their horns as proof to Piston who thanked her and then asked her to defeat the Spectre's shield-bearers. After taking them down, she returned back to Piston, who asked her to help Harpoon. Harpoon told her that Kaiser had been helping them with their food shortage and asked if she could help clear up the supply routes. In order to help him out, she defeated the red and blue spears along the route. Next, she helped him steal shields from the Spectre's shield-bearers for their troops. With the supply route problem fixed, she went to report to Piston and asked where Kaiser was. Piston explained that Kaiser had gone to Pantheon with the Blue Dragon Cannon. She returned to Pantheon and met with Cartalian, who told her that they were experiencing problems with the weapon. 
Beldar then approached her and asked her to deal with the once peaceful dino goths, who had grown violent ever since the specters had begun destroying their homes. After she returned, Beldar informed her that Kaiser had already left for Helysium with the blue dragon cannon. She then went after him and managed to catch up with him. Kaiser told her that the specters were behaving oddly, and that he suspected that they had learned that the blue dragon cannon was being moved. Though she offered to team up with him to deal with them, Kaiser asked her to ensure that the cannon reached Adia while he covered her. Author's note, this is a minor contradiction to Kaiser's storyline for the Helysium Prequest, in which he personally delivers it to Adia. She brought the cannon to Adia and explained the situation to her. Adia asked her to help Tyran scout for potential targets for the weapon while Kaiser finished dealing with the specters. When she met Tyran, he explained that he had been chased off by specter battlehounds while spying on the enemy. In sympathy, she went to defeat the specter battlehounds in order to get revenge on his behalf. After returning, she realized that Tyran was too young to be in such a dangerous occupation and decided to take over scouting duties for him. Author's note, I'm like 99% sure that he's the same age as her, if not even older. She snuck into the enemy territory herself and discovered the location of their base, which she reported to Adia. However, Adia told her that Kaiser had already fired the cannon on the coordinates that Tyran had provided. Believing that Tyran had gotten the coordinates incorrectly while running for his life, she decided to fire the cannon using the coordinates that she had found. Author's note, the prompt has you enter your three favorite numbers and three least favorite numbers for the coordinates. She then excitedly told Adia that she had fired on the specter's base, but Adia looked at the coordinates and angrily told her that they had nothing to do with the specter's base. She then ordered her to check with Tyran in order to find out what exactly she had blown up. However, Tyran told her that she had fired in the middle of a secret specter supply base and hit a powder keg, completely obliterating the base. Author's note, luck isn't even her primary stat, but I bet that your favorite thief class could never. <laughs> she reported the news to Adia, who forgave her and then asked her to hunt down the fleeing specters who were attempting to escape the cannon's volley. After she returned from her mission, Adia told her that the specters were in disarray. It was while they were in disarray. It was the perfect time for training. She then asked her to see Urinth, whom she described as a great sage of Grandis. Author's note, I have this semi-crack theory that Urinth comes from the realm of the sages, and that he either left or was exiled, and I can't believe that I'm saying this, but even in spite of all his degeneracy, you can still make a strong argument that he has the moral high ground over the elders, after what they did in Odium. After arriving at Urinth's hut, she was subjugated to his leering gaze, which also allowed him to learn her true identity. He explained that his ability to see the heart of things was what had allowed him to become a great sage. Escalade was dubious about Urinth's skills and believed him to be a fraud, but just then Urinth revealed that he was able to perceive Escalade's soul from inside the relic. After Angelic Buster introduced them, they began speaking about the old days and bonded over their taste in young women. Author's note, I want to record this clearly. I want the record to clearly state that the people who wrote this are not only my 13th reason why, but also my 12th, 11th, 10th, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, and 1st. <laughs> oh my lord. Yurinth then agreed to train her to efficiently use Escalade's powers. He turned her over to his pet, Popo, who began training her concentration by asking her to hunt dino rams and bring back their claws as proof. After training, Urinth had, Ang had Angelic Buster do the laundry while he and Escalade went over potential redesigns to her outfit, which featured a significantly shorter skirt length. Author's note, if you were one of the writers who worked on Angelic Buster's storyline and you're reading this, please jump into moving traffic. Having finished her training, Urinth gave her the D-03 transmitter and told her to go to the secret merchant meetup in order to learn from the shadow dealers. 
She spoke with Romero, who told her that she would need to stock up on products in order to become a real shadow dealer. He first had her collect Tamer's whips from the Spectre Tamers. Next, he told her to collect Inkwell coins, though she had no idea how to obtain them. Suddenly, her D-03 transmitter rang, and Tornero spoke to her, explaining that Romero had tricked her into helping him, and instead suggested that she team up with him in exchange for fair compensation. He then had her collect Dino Dawn's sharp fangs, and gave her a merchant crew gold pouch, which he explained was tradable with any shadow dealer. After he left, Galero called her on the transmitter, and explained that he had information about Tonero and Romero in exchange for the gold pouch that she had. He explained that the two brothers used to be best friends until a gap between their sales records had started widening, causing Romero to begin scheming in order to escape being number two. She noted that they sounded just like Kyle and Felderoth, and decided that she would try to fix their relationship. Author's note, Angelic Buster, I can fix him. Narrator, she in fact made him worse. Galero suggested that they interrupt Panero's supply chain in order to help Romero catch up. In order to do so, she defeated Dinodons, thus preventing the sale of their sharp fangs. Next, Galero gave her a merchant crew gold pouch in order to buy the bad stock that Romero had. On her way, she realized that she had lost the gold pouch and spent time hunting it down from the nearby monsters. With the gold, she was able to buy back Romero's bad stock. Hoping that she had helped reconcile their differences, she called Tenero, who accused her of manipulating him for money. She attempted to explain, but he told her that she would only be able to make it up to him in exchange for Dino Ram Claws. After bringing Tenero his claws, Romero called her and accused her of teaming up with Tonero to ruin him. After she explained the situation to Galero, Romero colluded that Galero concluded that Galero was using his feud with Tonero in order to get out on top. After conferring with Tonero, he got back to her and explained that Galero was using her in order to take the top spot. But this realization had helped him reunite with Tonero. They then asked her to help them defeating Galero by defeating Spectre Miners and stealing their sparkling Spectre Stones before Tolero did, or Galero did. Next, Tenero asked her to collect an illusory gold pouch from Urinth and traded it with Galero. When she went to collect it from Urinth, however, he demanded that she call him your most, your most darling and handsome Urinth in exchange for the pouch. Author's note, in the text prompt where you have to type it in, the default text says, why are all old men so gross? If I could talk to Angelic Buster from across the screen, I'd tell her that it's because the old men writing, the old men writers thought to themselves, hey, you know what would be a great idea? Let's make a character and have her be the exact same age as our target demographic. Then, let's put her through the ringer of sexualization and misogyny to show our young player base exactly what's in store for them in the real world. Then, they'll high-five each other and say, isn't pedophilia the most hilarious thing ever? We're so funny, we should get a race, or something to that effect. I'd also tell Angelic Buster that I'm down to beat Urinth to death with a sledgehammer together. I'm pretty sure that her third job skill called Heavenly Crash is a great is a giant pink version of that anyways. After she redu reluctantly said the words, she traded the pouch with Galero, who initially laughed at her foolishness, though he soon realized that the money had faded away. For helping reconcile them and taking down Galero, Tenero made her an honorary member of the Shadow Dealers. Author's note, step aside, Kadena, there's a new hero of justice in town. After helping Tenero, Angelic Buster went to see Adia, who told her that the preparations for the full-scale assault on the central regions were nearly complete. Adia asked her to help by defeating the Spectre Miners and reclaiming the, the ores that they had stolen. She also helped Maroon stock up on blue spear for coats and animal oil. After returning, Adia told her that Tyrion had been abducted by the specters. 
Angelic Buster went to investigate the last place that he had been spotted fighting, where she defeated the Spectre Battlehounds in the area. However, she was unable to find any traces of Tyran and returned back to the base, where Adia informed her that Kaiser had rescued him while she had been away. Adia then asked her to help Maroon get Tyran back into fighting shape, as he seemed shell shell shocked. Maroon asked her to collect Battlehound's broken horns so that he could make him a hearty meal. With the horns, Maroon created a rather disgusting meal and asked her to deliver it to Tyran, who graciously ate it in spite of his ta in spite of its taste. Next, she met with Adia, who briefed her on a trap that they had intended to lure the enemies into. With Kaiser serving his base as bait, she asked Angelic Buster to sweep into the area, to sweep in from behind and trap the specters in a pincer attack. After Angelic Buster herded them all into the valley, Adia shot a powerful lightning spell that obliterated the specter army in the area. Next, Angelic Buster defeated the fleeing specters as part of the Nova's counterattack. After returning back to base, Adia told her that she had found a wound that she had found a weakness in the specters' ranks, explaining that besides a few commanders, most specters were unintelligent. Because of this, Adia believed that they could pursue this, that they could pressure the specters into a trap. Soon after, the Nova were able to push forward to downtown Helysium. Adia told Angelic Buster that she had sent Kaiser to find Urinth and gather intelligence on the castle's interior, and so Adia asked her to speak with Piston in the meantime. Piston asked her to defeat the Spectre Miners and Spectre Shieldbearers in the city. Next, he asked her to bring Dino Goth shoulder meat, Dino Dawn fangs, and Yellow Spear torn fur coats for Harpoon and Maroon. She then decided to visit Urinth as she hoped that Kaiser would be there as well. However, Urinth told her that she had just missed Kaiser, though he gave her the same information about Victor and Shriglo that he had provided to Kaiser, in exchange for a written letter with the intelligence about Victor and Shriglo, she gave Dinorim tenderloins to Popo, as Urinth never fed it, and brought yellow spear fur coats to Urinth. Author's note, you find out that Urinth is 650 years old in this quest, which absolutely does not help his case. Urinth then realized that she had been finding fur coats for him, that he had already sent Kaiser with the letter. Wait, what? Urinth then realized, while she had been finding fur coats for him, that he had already sent Kaiser with the letter. Annoyed, she returned to Adia, who told her that something major was happening at the castle gates. There, she witnessed Kaiser facing off against Velderoth. After their battle, she went to speak with Adia, who told her that it was likely that Velderoth had been made the third guardian of Elysium. She also explained that they needed to find a way to break into the castle and asked her to contact the Shadow Dealers. Angelic Buster spoke with Romero, who told her that they were planning to distribute antidotes for Trigolos chemical traps and asked her to collect Spectre's deadly poisons from the general Spectres. Next, she went to help Tonero, who told her that Romero was foolishly trying to create an antidote with only the poison. He explained that they would need a component of the antibody they resi that resisted the poison, and asked her to hunt hard black horns from power Spectres, which were immune to Spectre poison. Tonero then began searching began researching the chemical agents, and learned that Triglo was using a chemical which couldn't be obtained in Grandis, realizing that it was the reason why no one had been able to make a successful antidote. He suspected that Magnus had brought it back from Maple World. He also discovered that there was a flower called the Coated Hysop Flower, carried by specters in the central region, and asked her to collect some. On her way there, Piston also asked her to eliminate the Spectre Tamers, Spectre Miners, and Spectre Shield Bearers in the central regions. She brought the flowers to Tenero, who began to use them to make his antidote. He told her that Romero had allegedly succeeded in making his antidote with only the poison and asked her to pay him a visit. Romero asked her to drink the antidote in order to test it out. Author's note, you can either choose to drink the antidote yourself or make Romero drink it. Either way, you need a cure for the fatigue 
or for the flatulence that it call causes, which you can help Tenero make by bringing him Spectre's deadly poison. I would recommend that you drink the antidote, as it's required to get the story achievement for Angelic Buster. I didn't find out later, until later, and now I'm annoyed that I'll need to redo the Helysium story on a new Angelic Buster in order to get it. Soon after, Adia told her that Kaiser had given them a direct path to launch a counterattack, and asked her to defeat the Power Spectres and Spectre Engineers. Next, she spoke with Tyrion, who asked her to intercept some of the Spectre's messages. She returned with the intercepted messages, though Tyrion found that they were encrypted. They brought the messages to Adia, who managed to decrypt them, and learned that the Spectres were planning to seize, seize the central region and trap Kaiser within. To counter them, Adia planned to use Angelic Buster, who seemed to be a wild card to the enemies, and had her attack the Spectres from behind in order to scatter their ranks. Though they managed to succeed, Histon was badly wounded. Angelic Buster visited him, visited him in the clinic, where he asked her to perform a show for him with Adia, she returned to Adia and spent three hours persuading her to go on stage together. After Adia agreed, Angelic Buster helped Harpoon and Maroon collect Sparkle Spectre Stones for decorations and Spectre's wooden shields and Spectre's wrenches to build the stage. With the stage and decorations ready, Angelic Buster and Adia gave a largely successful performance. Hidena Hidena received a message from Gen asking her to meet in the back alley. There he told her of an opportunity to settle her grudge with Magnus, and explained that the Nova were planning to, land, to launch an attack on Elysium. After she expressed her interest, Gen told her that he would contact the Elysium branch of the Shadow Dealers, and gave her a D-03 transmitter. He told her to speak with Beldar in Pantheon, and reminded her, above all, to never reveal her true identity. In Pantheon, Beldar told her to meet with Tyrion at the Transitional Dimensional Door, where he would guide her to the commanders. There, Tyrion told her that the Spectres had attacked the base, and that Adia and Piston were trapped inside. Adia fought through the Spectre forces and reached Adia in Piston. Adia was impressed by her unorthodox tactics, but wondered about Cadena, since she didn't seem like a Nova. Cadena explained that her story was complex, but that she, ha that she was committed to taking down Magnus. Adia welcomed her to the Land of Dragons and asked for her help in aiding the Helysium Reclamation HQ. Histon first asked her to defeat the Spectre Battlehounds, which had largely, be largely been responsible for finding their base. Next, Adia asked her to attack the Spectre Shieldbearers in order to secure their supply routes. With their front lines stabilized, Adia asked her to help Harpoon get supplies. Harpoon asked her to obtain Dinogoth's shoulder meat for the soldiers. To help get strong wood and armor, Cadena suggested that they obtain some from the spectred shield bearers. Next, Harpoon told her that the supply route was too far away and that the enemy camp was slowing them down. That an enemy camp was slowing them down. Kadena offered to destroy the enemy camp in order to open up their supply lines. With the enemy forced to retreat, Harpoon told Kadena that it would be that they would be able to open up a new supply route. Piston congratulated her on her work and explained that they were planning to use the blue dragon cannon in order to attack the specters. He told her that they had reached a setback while constructing it and asked her to help Cartalian, as he knew that Kadena was experienced with weapons. Cartalian and Beldar asked her to collect animal oil from the Red Spears in order to help the weapon run. After she brought the oil, Beldar told her that the ancient schematics were too faint to read, and so they weren't sure of what to do in order to finish construction. Unsure herself about what to do, Cadena decided to call the Helysium branch of the Shadow Dealers, as Gen had told her to contact them if she had run into trouble. At the secret merchant meetup, she used the D-03 transmitter to contact Romero, who arrived and gave her the updated schematics. When Cadena asked about payment, Romero explained that the Helysium branch had an understanding with Gen, who had saved them a while back. She brought the schematics back to Beldar, who excitedly showed it to Cartalian. 
With the new schematics, they were able to finish construction on the blue dragon cannon. While construction on the weapon was happening, Kadena contacted Cody and asked him to meet her at the back alley so that he could help her add the black dragon cannon or blue dragon cannon to her arsenal. Cody took the schematics and set to work on adding the extra modifications which Kadena had asked for. Author's note, this is the backstory to one of Kadena's fifth job skills called the Apocalypse Cannon, which is a reforged version of the Blue Dragon Cannon combined with Shadow Dealer tech. At the Helysium Reclamation HQ, Adia told Kadena that the Blue Dragon Cannon had been largely successful in helping them with their counterattack. With their next move being retaking the city center, she asked Kadena to gather intelligence for their next move. She asked Kadena to speak with Urinth and learn what he knew about the region. At, fir at Urinth's hut, Urinth found Kadena to be familiar, but he nevertheless told her to leave him alone. Even after being threatened, Urinth refused to speak, and so Kadena decided to call the Shadow Dealers. Dinero met her at the meetup spot and told her that Urinth may speak to her if she gave him a gift. Kadena gathered yellow spear fur coats and brought them to Urinth who simply took the gift and fell asleep. Frustrated, Kadena returned to Tonero, who suggested that she gather Dinodon ribs for Urinth's pet, Popo. Kadena gathered the ribs and brought them to Urinth, who ate them all himself without saving any for her or Popo. Kadena once again returned to Tonero, who decided to pull his failsafe, a limited edition, hand-stamped figurine of Angelic Buster. Though Tenero secretly told her that the hand stamp was from a yellow spear, making it a counterfeit. <laughs> After she brought it to Urinth, the sage began scribbling like a madman and gave her the letter to give to Adia in exchange for the figurine. With Urinth's intelligence, Adia was able to devise a plan to draw the specters to one spot, where she would finish them off with a single blow. While Kaiser drew the enemy out and Angelic Buster provided rear support, Adia asked Kadena, tasked Kadena with disrupting the enemy's communications with explosives. However, she explained that the enemy used explosive signals to quickly dispatch orders, which was why there were explosives piled up throughout Helysium's forests. Adia wanted to take advantage of these explosives, but since they were too spaced or since they were spaced too far apart, there was no way to detonate them all at once without alerting the enemy. However, Kadena formulated a plan to deal with it using her royal crest. She went to the Nova royal family's secret passageway near the barracks at the twisted forest border where she placed the crest into a rock which lit up and revealed the passageway. Author's note, I'm really glad that the writers gave Kadena a unique script for the Helysium prequest as it gives her some story t it gives her storyline some much needed development. For a while, I used to have mixed feelings about Kadena and her story. To give some background, there were rumors that Kadena was originally described to be the fabled Resistance Thief class before the KMS director made a push for the grandest story to be put into focus. If, we're, if we compare what her role in the Shadow Dealers is with what her role in the Resistance would have been, it's easy to see that both of them are really similar in terms of aesthetics and character background. With the context of what possibly went on behind the scenes, it seems like the writers wrote her new story fairly last minute to account for the abrupt change, and at, f and at first, and at first to me, it felt like her being the Nova Princess was tacked on as an afterthought in order to give her some sort of connection to Grandis. In her class story, her being the Nova Princess has next to no actual significance. It's brought up for 10 seconds during her fight with Mr. Hazard, and at first glance, it feels like absolutely nothing meaningful would have changed if they removed the detail. Even after the events of Tenebris, Kadena makes it absolutely clear that she has no interest in taking back her throne, because she vowed to herself that she was going to leave her past behind. My initial feelings were disappointment, because it felt like a wasted opportunity to not add some narrative tension between Kadena and Kaiser in terms of who gets to be the face of the Nova Resistance, with Kaiser being the established guardian of the Nova and Kadena wanting to retake her birthright and lead her people herself. However, 
Kadena eschewing the throne falls perfectly in line with her character. At her heart, Kadena is deeply traumatized, and her entire story arc revolves around her trying to find meaning in all of the trauma. She tried escaping her past by completely reinventing herself with a new name, and she even went so far as to cut off her Nova features in her quest to become someone else entirely. Because of this, it wouldn't make sense for Kadena to want the throne back with the weight of her family's deaths and a blood-soaked crown hanging over her head. Despite how interesting it would be for Kadena and Kaiser to butt heads, I think it makes the most sense for her character arc to develop like this, and in a way, I kind of approve I kind of appreciate the fact that Kadena not having much of a stake in the lore means that there can be a greater focus on her personal journey in trying to find some meaning in all the violence that tore her life apart. As she entered the passageway, Kadena reminisced about how she used to hide in the passageway when she had when she wanted time alone. She recalled that the adults would use them to travel undercover and that she never expected that the passageway would be used for a siege. She also remembered that there were three entrances to the secret passageway, all of which passed through the Forest of Elysium. She first went to the Forest of Choices and detonated the explosives before quickly moving to the Spectre Mine Zone and the Spectre Forward Base. Having detonated all the explosives, she returned to the battlefield and joined in on the fight. With her aid, Adia was able to destroy all of the specters with a powerful lightning spell. Pressing their advantage, they pushed out the enemies in the central region in order to make their new base of operations. Having taken down the downtown market, Kadena spoke with Piston, who asked her to rendezvous with Tyrion. Tyrion told her that they, would be mo that they would be working together to defeat the rest of the enemies in the western district. They first took down the Gorilla Spectres in the downtown district. As Kadena moved to the next area, she found scribbles on the wall that spelled out, Leaving Home. They then, found, they then fought off the Spectre Engineers, where she found another scribble of two dragons, an adult and a child, with the words, Where the Moon and Stars Dance. Finally, they reached the last area and fought off the Power Spectres. There she found a doodle of someone wearing a crown, and a small happy dragon with the words sleep with a smile written on it. After Tyrion left, Kadena suddenly recalled the, located, the location hinted by the drawings and headed to a secret tunnel that she had discovered as a little girl, which she would retreat into whenever she got in trouble. She wondered why the drawings still remained and felt as though someone had wanted her to find them. Inside the secret tunnel, she found a box filled with old memorabilia, such as a slingshot, a wooden sword, a bouquet, and a letter. She recalled how she had gotten the bouquet and written the letter to her mother as a surprise, which she remembered had been the day before Magnus had sacked Helysium. As the scent of the flowers filled her nose, she turned away, reminding herself of her oath to never look back. Author's note, little details like this did a lot or did a great job of adding to Kadena's personal journey, with her being forced to confront the past in the face of her decision to leave it all behind. Just then, Adia messaged her to return immediately. She told Kadena that they had played into the enemy's hands, and that the specters had set up a trap for Kaiser. While Angelic Buster held the rear, she asked Kadena to strike at the enemy's flanks. Kadena successfully push, helped push back the enemies, though Adia told her that Piston had been injured. Kadena went to speak with him at the Pantheon Clinic, where he told her about the concert that Angelic Buster and Adia were performing. At the concert, Kadena also performed tricks, such as knife juggling. After the concert was over, Adia and Kadena... Adia told Kadena that she would contact her once the seal on the castle had been broken. Ilium Author's Note all grandest classes before, besides Kaiser, Angelic Buster, and Kadena are treated as though they come from the Maple World because they've all been given the generic storyline that I've covered at the top of this section. These classes typically have a class-exclusive quest to initiate the Elysium prequest, followed by a class-exclusive quest after retaking downtown Elysium. Kailan summoned Ilium to Pantheon who told him that Beldar had requested aid from the Maple Alliance about reclaiming Helysium. 
Ilium noted that Beldar didn't trust him, but Kylan told him that Beldar might see the verdant flora in a different light if Ilium were to help the Nova. Ilium went to see Beldar, who told him that though he still didn't trust him, he trusted Kylan's recommendation. He asked Ilium to meet with Tyrion, who would escort him to Edia in Piston. At the transitional dimensional door, Tyrion told Ilium that the Spectres had launched a surprise attack and that Adia and Piston were cut off from the rest of the soldiers. Ilium fought off the invaders and reached the commanders. Author's note, the rest of the storyline is the same as the generic one, with the rest of this section taking place after securing downtown. Sometime after pushing into downtown Helysium, Morian contacted Ilium and told him that Beldar wanted to speak with him. In Pantheon, Beldar told Ilium how Adia had mentioned that he had been helpful in reclaiming Helysium, for which Beldar wanted to offer his deepest gratitude and apologies for mistrusting Ilium and the other Verdant Flora. He admitted that the Nova records of the Verdant Flora revealed a dark history, but that Ilium's actions had proven that their histories were biased. He welcomed the Verdant Flora to visit Pantheon whenever they wished and implored them to let him know if they ever needed the Nova's help. Ark Kaiser contacted Ark to let him know about the good news that he had mentioned during their encounter in Sleepywood and asked him to come to Pantheon. He reassured Ark that the barrier wouldn't affect him as much since he was stronger now, though he warned that Ark would still feel weaker in Pantheon. Kaiser told him that he had convinced the council to allow Ark to join the Helysium Reclamation HQ though he added that not everyone had agreed. Even though he knew that Ark didn't have bad intentions, Kaiser explained that he still needed proof that the Nova would be safe, since it was his responsibility as the Guardian. However, he then added that Ark's lack of hesitation to help those in trouble served as proof enough for him. He also told Ark that though he hadn't been able to tell him before, the people who had arrived in Pantheon earlier had been Verdant Flora adding that Ark may encounter them soon. Ark was hesitant about the news, as he was worried about how the Verdant Flora would take his presence as a High Flora. Nevertheless, he went to Pantheon and met Beldar, who directed him to meet Tyrion. Tyrion told him of a surprise attack by the Spectres and asked Ark for help. Author's note, the rest of the storyline is the same as the generic one, with the rest of this section taking place after securing downtown. After helping retake Helysium downtown, Ark met with Cadena and introduced himself, reminding her that they had met before in Savage Terminal. He explained his situation to her, and though she still didn't fully trust him, she acknowledged that his actions to help the Helysium Reclamation HQ. Oh, she acknowledged that his actions, as well as having saved Cody during their first encounter, was enough to make her believe that at the very least, he wasn't a follower of Magnus. As they talked, Cadena told him about how Mr. Hazard had nearly destroyed Savage Terminal while making a weapon for Magnus. After Cadena left, Ark realized that the High Flora's reach was long enough to have even reached Savage Terminal. At Urant's hut, Ark met Angelic Buster and told her about how Kaiser had, had recommended him to join the Helysium Reclamation HQ. She told him that she was grateful for more allies, as it had taken a lot of people to help breach the city. He asked her who else had helped to retake Elysium, to which she replied that she had only heard of the Maple Alliance, the Hero of Justice, and another person who looked similar to Ark, realizing that it was likely a verdant flora. Ark asked if she knew where they were. She pointed him to the city center, where he encountered Ilium. Though he was nervous, Ark shared his story while Ilium occasionally asked questions politely. He also listened to Ilium's story about the Verdant Flora and how Darmor had recently discovered their home. Ilium told Ark that it had been his master's dying wish that the High Flora be stopped and hoped that they would meet again. Adele Adele received a letter from Fennel asking for her aid in retaking Helysium. She traveled to Pantheon and met Beldar, who told her, that he didn't trust at that though he didn't trust to the her, he was willing to work with her because of Fennel's recommendation. He told Adele to meet with Tyrion, who told her about the Spectre's surprise attack. Author's note: the rest of the story is the same as the generic one, 
with the rest of this section taking place after securing downtown. After taking downtown Elysium, Beldar summoned Adele back and apologized for his behavior, calling her a true friend of the Nova. Kane. Kane received a letter from Gen, who wrote that the Nova were planning to retake Elysium and asked him to assist them, as the Nova were one of the Shadow Dealer's biggest clients and their loss would affect the Shadow Dealers. In exchange for access to the Shadow Dealer's intelligence work, Kane agreed to help the Nova. Cain met Beldar in Pantheon, who recognized him by the new name that Gen had given him. Author's note, this is just the IGN of the player character. He told Cain to meet Tyrion, who told him about the surprise attack from the Spectres. Author's note, the rest of this storyline takes or is the same as the generic one, with the rest of the section taking place after securing downtown. After taking Elysium downtown, Beldar summoned him back and thanked him for his help. He told Cain to tell Gen that there wouldn't be any more issues in their future dealings and that he didn't need to worry about picking up the tab. He also told Cain that Fennel had sent her best wishes and had asked him to tell Cain, Memories and Malice are one. You will find both whether you want them or not. Laura while on her travels, Laura was approached by Cain on behalf of the Shadow Dealers, who told her that the Nova were preparing to retake Elysium. Cain was surprised that Laura rapidly, or readily, accepted his request without even considering stipulations, payment, or even details. He connected her with Beldar in Pantheon, who explained their situation and asked her to meet Tyrion. Tyrion explained that the Spectres had launched a surprise attack on the base. Author's note. The rest of the storyline is the same as the generic one, with the rest of this section taking place after securing the downtown. After taking downtown Elysium, Beldar summoned her back and thanked her for her help. Ho Young Ho Young received a letter from Fennel, asking for his aid in retaking Elysium. He traveled to Pantheon and introduced himself to Beldar, who was surprised to see an anima not in hiding. He told Ho Young to meet Tyrion, who told him about the surprise attack from the Spectres. Author's note, the rest of this storyline is the same as the generic one. Un unlike the other classes, Beldar doesn't thank you after helping secure the downtown district. Paths converge here. Author's note, this latter part of the Helysium storyline is the same for all classes. Some time later, the Alliance member returned to see if Adia needed more help. She greeted them and explained that they needed to defeat the Knights of Magnus in order to fully retake Elysium. She explained that Magnus had three knights, Trigla, Victor, and Velderoth. Though she believed Victor and Velderoth's power to be roughly comparable, she felt that they should target Trigla's laboratory first, as he had access to more information. For their first mission, she asked them to defeat the chemically enhanced creatures called Purple Reagent Rocks and asked them to bring back the broken flasks so that she could study them. She also gave them a D-02 transmitter in order to communicate when needed. After they returned, Adia told them that she would examine the flasks while they, com while they completed their next mission. She explained that there was an underground passageway that led to Trigo's, Triglo's laboratories, which had three floors ever since the old days in Elysium. She asked them to defeat the warrior specters and magician specters in his laboratory and then communicate their status with the receiver. After they defeated the specters, Adia instructed them to reach the second floor of the basement. The Alliance member arrived at the second floor, where Adia told them that Trigla would be located on the third floor and instructed them to defeat the purple reagent rocks and red reagent rocks. The Alliance member then pushed their way to the laboratory entrance, where they found the door locked. They reported it to Adia, who told them that she had expected as much and asked them to regroup at the downtown black market. Back at the HQ, Adia told them that Trigolo's locks were sealed with a high-level chemical agent and asked them to check with the shadow dealers, who were well-versed in chemistry. As Trigolo was a prominent figure during the old days, she explained there was likely a great deal of documentation on his research, and so, she contacted Tenero to investigate. Tenero told them that Adia's experiments were nearly successful, 
but added that she needed a reagent in order to complete the formula. He finished crafting it and told them to give it to Adia, who had asked them to use it in order to enter Trigola's room. They poured the chemical on the door, successfully opening it. Adia told them that there was no, no way to free him from Darmor's control and that they needed to defeat him by force. After defeating Triglo, the Alliance member returned to Adia, who told them that Triglo's real body was likely somewhere else. Author's note, it's possible we might meet him during the mainland Grandis storyline. They also showed her a dragon claw shaped seal that Triglo carried. Adia explained that it was a fragment that the Guardians of Elysium held before Magnus had taken over, suspecting that the other knights had the other parts. For their next mission, Adia tasked them with defeating the high-ranking specters and the other creatures guarding, guarding Vector's room, as well as bringing back samples. In Victor's workshop, the Alliance member defeated the Red Totem staff monsters guarding his room and brought back ragged cloths for Adia. She noted that Victor had the ability to materialize objects with the power of a magical relic. After investigating them, she sent her findings to the Nova captains so that their troops would deal with Victor's creations. She told the Alliance member that Victor would likely have his workshop door locked, just like Triglo, and asked, her, and asked them to investigate the door to the second floor. As they made their way up the stairs, they suddenly found themselves falling off the steps. They explained the situation to Adia, who began to investigate. She called them back and explained that the staircase device utilized the three primary colors of light, which Victor knew about as a painter. She suspected that by mixing the three colors, Victor was able to use transparent light in order to make a staircase appear. Back at HQ, Adia told them that Victor's creations utilized the same magic as the staircase, meaning that the Alliance member could extract the light essence inside of them and craft something that would allow them to force their way into his workshop. After they defeated the Red Totem Staffs and brought back their, cr their creation essence, Adia crafted a distorted light essence that would allow them to climb the staircase. After reaching the next floor, Adia told them to defeat the Red Totem Staffs and Blue Totem Staffs in order to enter Victor's room. The Alliance member fought through the defenses and reached the door to Victor. Adia then contacted them and explained that Victor existed without a body, Trapped in a magical canvas, the Alliance member was able to defeat Victor and return to Adia with the second seal. With both Triglo and Victor defeated, Tartalian moved his troops to Elysium in order to reinforce them. He asked the Alliance member to thin out the Spectre forces guarding Velderoth. After defeating the warrior Spectres, they returned to Cartalian, who thanked them and asked them to help Adia. Adia told them that she had investigated the seals and asked them to speak with Fennel at the Great Temple. Fennel told them that she had discovered how the relics were combined and asked them to tell Adia that they could, f that they could figure it all out if they knew what the materials were involved. The Alliance member returned to Adia and reported Fennel's findings. She asked them to continue pushing towards Velderoth while she investigated the seal relics. They defeated the magician specters guarding the path to Velderoth and recovered a letter written by Magnus. After they showed it to Adia, she determined that it was encrypted and told them to show it to Tyrion, who was, exper was experienced with enemy codes. When Tyrion was unable to decipher it, he had them give it to Tenero, who determined that it wasn't a code, but rather it was a special paper that absorbed all ink until orange juice was poured on it. With that knowledge, Tyrion finished deciphering the code and told them to bring it to Adia. Just then, Cartalian approached them and requested for them to ask Adia about Velderoth as well. Adia told them that they would be able to make the key to reach Magnus after obtaining the final seal from Velderoth. Once the Alliance member fought and defeated Velderoth, they brought back the final seal to Adia and told her that Velderoth had been smiling before he had disappeared, making them wonder if he was still alive. Adia dismissed their concerns, telling them that they would be able to defeat him again if needed, but she asked them to speak with Tyrion to confirm their suspicions. 
as Tyrion had been near the area where their fight had happened. Tyrion told them that she had seen one injured person leaving Helysium in a hurry, though he hadn't gotten a good look at them. They reported back to Adia, who was concerned that they didn't know about Velderos' whereabouts. Author's note, okay, but she literally didn't care a moment ago. However, she successfully fused the relics together and gave it to the Alliance member so that they could enter the throne room. Using the relic, the Alliance member entered the throne room and after a fierce battle, forced Magnus to retreat. Though the Alliance member was highly suspicious that he hadn't been using his full power, during the fight, Magnus also lost control of Guaru's power, allowing it to flow back into him. On Maple World, The Alliance member returned to Adia, who thanked them for helping the Nova take back Elysium. During the battle, Magnus also lost Kaiserium, which was reclaimed by Kaiser. After Adia helped him remove Kaiser's curse on the blade, he was able to wield the legendary blade of Kaiser once again. Following the battle, Kadena tearfully left flowers on the throne of her family, telling herself that even if her family were to somehow come back, things would never be the same, and that she would never be who she was before. She resolved to stay on the path that she had committed herself to, hoping that she would one day make sense of why she was the only one who had survived. Author's note. Honestly, the writers did a phenomenal job with how they handled Cadena in this storyline. I like that despite her finally defeating Magnus, which is meant to be the, culminating, the culmination of the goal that she'd set for herself at the start of her storyline, it doesn't actually give her any closure. Usually, beating the main antagonist of your story is supposed to feel momentous and celebratory, but here, it only feels hollow and feric. It's a good reminder that you can't erase trauma just by being rid of the things that caused it. I'm usually pretty wary of how media depicts trauma because of how they often simplify it as something that you can just overcome by confronting the root of it and, live and living happily ever after, which is rarely ever true. Sometimes, you'll never get any closure no matter what you do, and even when you're doing everything right, you might come out feeling even worse. I think that the media really needs to move past the idea of characters overcoming trauma and never having it be a problem for them again, because not only is it blatantly false, but the people who consume the media end up getting the wrong message. A lot of times, people describe overcoming trauma as a road, as though it's a journey of some sort, where you can point at yourself and say, look, I'm halfway to the finish line. I think that analogy is pretty reductionist, because in my experience, the road to recovery is almost never linear. For every day that you're going forward, you'll have some where you're running in circles, and some where you'll find yourself going backwards. You can't, divor you can't divorce yourself from trauma by crossing some magical finish line, because you can't remove something that, that's now become a part of you, no matter how much you wish it wasn't. For me, I like to view coping with trauma as a thermometer. The goal isn't to reach a finish line, it's to stay warm enough for as long as possible. Some days you'll feel like there's a fire in your head that you can't put out. Other days you'll shut down as though you're buried six feet deep in a snowfield. Thermometers are sensitive, like a hairpin trigger, and even something as small as a thought can affect the reading. But eventually, you figure out how to dress for the seasons and the weather gets even more bearable every year. Even, the, even then though, trauma can still creep up on you, even if you thought you were long past it, and that's perfectly okay. Your progression isn't defined by outrunning the things that hurt you. Even accepting that you'll never know peace is a form of closure in itself. Just like what Kadena said earlier, finding meaning in all the things that were once senseless is the closest thing there is to moving forward. This has been a really heavy way to close out this ridiculously long section, but I think that it's an important PSA to anyone who needs to hear it. And also, it's a topic that it's very personal for me. With that being said, this is a website about a happy mushroom game, so I'll end it on a positive note. Here's a link to one of my favorite MapleStory meme videos of all time. <laughs>